This episode is proudly supported by Pepe Sayer Australian Cultured Butter, batch churned from single origin cream. We've got a culturing process, a fermenting process, an aging process. So the butter will taste very different than, I guess, the average supermarket butter. Uh, I like to say we make butter makers butter. Like this is the sort of butter butter makers will would like to eat simply because of the slow process in which we ferment and age and, and get the flavour into it. You know, the natural fermentation that gets all the flavours into the cream and then once you churn it, you end up with this really rich, flavoursome butter that evolves and changes because it's a live culture that's in the butter as well. For more information, go to pepisaya.com.au. I think my biggest satisfaction is, you know, seeing the smiles on people's face and take something from a raw product and and create something that is eaten in seconds, but hopefully it's like remembered for, for a long time. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. There's something quite exciting going on in Perth at the moment, a blossoming and evolution of the culinary scene. On the foundation built by a swag of legends, something new is emerging. What does the modern Perth diner expect post-COVID and how has it impacted on the evolution of the dining landscape? Shane Milson is the head chef of the soon-to-be-opened Six Head in Perth. Shane, how are you? Yeah, great. How are you, Huck? Great. It's good to get you on the show. You've got an exciting new role with a restaurant that's going to open a bit later in the year. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, that's correct. So um, Six Head, um, we're opening in the Chevron Towers in um, Elizabeth Key. So we're a uh, modern Australian uh, restaurant who's going to be focusing on dry aging, you know, local, local produce and celebrating West Australian produce as well. So... Yeah, and the, the Six Head, there's one in Sydney as well as part of the Seagrass group, and there's a real sort of focus on incredible beef as well and, and Wagyu. Tell us a little bit about that program. Yeah, so the, the dry aging program that we've got um, is, you know, working really closely with, with, with the farmers and with the cattle and understanding, you know, their, their story and their ethos so it can work with, within the group. What's what's this role like for you? I know, sort of, you just just stepped into the shoes, and the restaurant won't open t- till the end of the year. So you're part of part of the build. Um, tell us about what's going to happen in the next couple of months for you. Um, so the next couple of months for me, I've I've just started with them last week. So I'm getting to know all the management, getting to know all of their their systems and their you know, their procedures and all of that kind of stuff. Um, next week, I'll be traveling over to Sydney. Sorry, not next month. I'll be traveling over to Sydney. So, I'll be working out of the Six Head restaurant there um, just to, to get myself up to speed, understand how the restaurant runs, understand their story and see, you know, working really closely with the group exec chef, Sean, um, just so we can bring that to Perth. Is this something new for you? Have you been part of a restaurant from its inception to help build it and then open? Um, I've been a part of five openings in my career. Wow. Yeah. So this is going to be my fifth one. Um, But I've never been this uh, like far back, if that that makes sense. Like I've always been when the building's established and, you know, all of that. So this is, this is a new learning curve for me, which I'm really, really excited to, to be a part of. Well, I want to explore sort of what's going to happen with Six Head and um, that a little bit more down the track. Um, take us back to when you were young. You've had a pretty full career, um, you know, in Melbourne and Perth and, and in London, but what, what sort of role did food play for you when you were growing up? Uh, foods, food's always been around my family. Um, mum's side of the family is Maltese. So I've got now, I think our side of the family is about 40 strong and growing. So, (laughs) you know, Easter's and, and Christmas's, uh, it's always big, big food, food journeys for us. Tell us a little bit about uh, Maltese food. Is there any sort of festivals or dishes or feasts that you recall from growing up that sort of speak of that time? Um, well, I unfortunately, I lost my grandma when I was quite young. So she was the kind of 
the foodie of of understanding and and knowing that kind of tradition but we still try to keep you know family recipes and and things like that going and and handing them down uh, my uncle loves making sausages and all of that stuff like pastitsis are normally always at christmas time or easter time and and we still try to try to keep the tradition as the family gets older we still want to you know celebrate and respect our heritage when did you sort of first start getting interested in food and consider it as a career um it probably would have been in high school um there was there was two kind of paths that you could go when i was when i was in school it was either going down the university role and you know getting getting a degree in something or getting the trade and as as i got older school became a little bit more difficult for me and i fell in love with cooking what were your first sort of steps into the industry um so in year 10 we we got approached from uh, with doing like a pre-apprenticeship course so that involved going to school for a couple of days going to TAFE for a day and going into the workplace so i chose the hospitality profession and that that broke you down into like the three trades so you could do pastry you could do bakery or you could do um, commercial cookery tell us a little bit about what Perth and the commercial kitchens were like when you first started your career and um, what were the real important sort of venues for you uh, as you got started? Um, growing up, it was, you know, there was a lot of a lot of really, really good fine dining restaurants. I think the one that stands out a lot was somewhere that I kind of eventually got into a few years down into my career, which was Clark's of North Beach. So Stephen Clark, he's been my mentor since I've been 16, basically. Um, and I was very fortunate enough to have worked for him twice. We, we've had Stephen Clark on the, on the show and his influence over in Perth is quite extraordinary. Do you have any stories of sort of the influence that he's had on you? Yeah, well, Steve, like he was, he was a boss, um, but he was also, you know, like a second father to me. He, I was, I was young. I was 16 when I left, left school and did my apprenticeship. And, you know, he was, he was my age back then. So he was one of those, yeah, he was one of those young guns that was involved in mentoring all the young kids and, and he was judging all the competitions and me as a first year apprentice, I, I knew I knew about Steve because my my best friend from high school was an apprentice at Clark's of North Beach. So in my days off during my apprenticeship, I would go to Clark's and and be a kitchen hand just to see that side of 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 cooking. You know, I was I was infatuated by fine dining and and creating beautiful plates and putting art on on a plate, basically. What was it that you took from your time with Stephen that you've sort of held on to as you built your career? Um, I think never lose track of who you are and what, like where you want to go. You know, there's always going to be hard days and hospitality is really, really difficult. I think now, now more so it's, it's a lot spoken about, but back then it was one of those kind of careers that it's, you know, it's hard. And if you show weakness, then sometimes people can see that as, as a weakness. It's not uncommon for chefs to sort of travel the world and be a stagiaire at a well-known restaurant. You made your way over to Chicago at a very young age at Charlie Trotter's. How, how did that come about and what was the experience like? Um, so that was um, that was actually a prize. So, yeah, so I was involved going back to the competition side of, side of things. Um, it was a competition called the Nestle Golden Chef's Hat. Uh, I was very fortunate enough to win it two years in a row. Um, at that point, I was a, an apprentice in an under twenty-five year old competition. So I was, I was nineteen, I think, two thousand and nine. At yeah, two thousand and nine when when we first won that, and then went in it again and won it in two thousand and ten. And the two thousand and ten prize was going to Chicago and being able to stage at Charlie Trotter's, which was that was my first kind of experience in Michelin star kitchens. And I mean, if you're going to do 
do one, you're going to, it, it, that was probably one of the ones to, to see because he was, you know, the godfather of, of degustations really. How different was that kitchen to what you were used to? Oh, it was com- a completely, completely different scenario. Like polishing copper, copper pots before service, after service, 15 chefs, stagiaires. There was, it was just produce. It was phenomenal. It was a absolute eye opener to me. Uh, on on reflection, winning those awards at such a young age, what sort of, what sort of impact did that have on you? Looking back, um, I think at a young age, it kind of put a really, I mean, I wouldn't really say like a negative impact on myself, but it, it was definitely a lot of pressure because you're 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 winning these awards, you're in these competitions, and and you you obviously go in those competitions to win but you're also going there to better yourself and then not winning some competitions that you've trained for, for, for months and months and months, it, it can put a real, you know, a downer on yourself, especially at a young age without being able to know how to talk about it or how to process those kind of things. A lot of uh, chefs uh, head to the UK um, often to, to stage at a restaurant or to get some um, experience and a bit of a rite of passage um, tell us about your experience over there. Yeah, so I moved over to the UK when I was 23. Um, I was I was young. I was I, I had my dream job. I was I was junior sous chef at Clarkson North Beach at that stage. Um, but I I decided that it was time, you know, t- time to go over there and and experience that for myself. And Heston Blumenthal was always someone that I I aspired to kind of understand his his thoughts and how he how he creates the the magic that he creates on a plate and what goes into that kind of thing it was probably one of the first cookbooks that my parents bought me was the big fat duck cookbook so i was constantly reading that and wanting to learn about molecular molecular gastronomy and and understand the the science of cooking and what how things break down and and what makes you know this this perfect dish so I um I applied for for the fat duck and for dinner by Heston and ended up wanting to I wanted to live in London. So I went and yeah, got the job there and I stayed with them for my whole visa um length as I was only on a um a working visa. So that was just under 2 years in the London restaurant. Um and then fortunately they were opening up their Melbourne restaurant pretty much the same time that my visa ran out. So I had, I had like a one month transitional period where I was able to go back home to Perth, see my friends and see my family. And then I, I moved straight to Melbourne and I was part of the opening team for dinner in Melbourne. Take, take us back to the UK. You know, um, there's, a, there's an old saying about never meet your heroes, but sort of with that sort of yearning to sort of uh, go to a Heston restaurant and work in it, what, what was it like once you got through the door? Was it as you expected or quite different? Um, no, it was, it was definitely quite different, you know, because there's always stories of how hard kitchens can be and how brutal they can be, especially in a Michelin star restaurant. But that, that kitchen was, it, it was like, as they say, it was like a well-oiled machine. You know, they, they had their systems, they had their recipes, everything worked. And there was so many chefs. I think we had 50 chefs on the roster. So there was, there was people there that would train you. There were, if you didn't know what you were doing, you, you got taught how to do it. So it was a big, you know, it was a big family that everyone was there to, to bring everyone up and support everyone and help everyone. And if there was things you didn't know, they would teach you and teach you again. And so you would, so you understand what their end result was. Was dinner by Heston in Melbourne different to the London restaurant? Um, the, like the only difference was the produce really. So there's things you can get in the UK that unfortunately you can't get in Australia and, and, and vice versa. So they adapted their recipes to work in Australia for Australia with the recipes that were in, you know, in, in London. Take us into the kitchen there in Melbourne. What were some of the things that you took away from your time there about, about cooking and working in that team? Um, definitely understanding and appreciating produce. You know, it's, 
it takes a lot to to get some of these ex- extremely expensive produce, but you need to be able to respect those those items, you know, respecting the produce where it came from and understanding how everything kind of works, how everything cooks, what what it takes to break things down, and 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 all of that. Yeah, Heston um, is known as a bit of a magician on the plate. Was it? Was there any sort of dish that you could tell us about from your time working in these restaurants that kind of um, changed your way of thinking with food? Oh. Uh, there was there was endless dishes there that that made me really question how is this done. I think the one you know that would stand out the most is is obviously the meat fruit, the the chicken liver parfait dipped in the mandarin jelly. That that is just the most simplest looking dish, but the amount of work that went into it, it was a it was I think it was a three day process from start to finish to get that end result, which is just the parfait on the plate with bread. You ended up finding your way back to Perth. Tell us about that period of time and um, what lured you back to Perth? Um, so, I unfortunately, I came back because of um, some family concerns. So, my sister was – yeah, there's, there's some things happened with my sister. So, I basically got a phone call from my mum on a Wednesday, I think it was, and I was on a plane on the Friday back home. Um, and unfortunately, uh, I made the decision to be closer to my family in case anything did happen. And, you know, I don't, I don't regret it because I'm like, I'm so grateful nothing did happen to my sister or my family, but it was, you know, there's things that happen in life for a reason. And I believe that happened for a reason for me to come back home. Tell us about sort of how you found your feet in the kitchen in Perth, um, after coming back in those circumstances, uh, it was yeah. I, th- I was I was gone for three years, so Perth had changed from what it was when I left to where it was when I got back. You know, there was uh, numerous new restaurants opening, and and the the dining scene had changed uh, for what I what I saw it was restaurants. Great restaurants had closed, and other ones were still were still going, um, but. I was quite fortunate that Steve Clark hired me back as his head chef of Clark's North Beach again. So that was, you know, that was a real honor to be able to work there, train there, then go away and then be able to come back. How different was the dynamic between you and Stephen after being sort of there very early on in your career and he as a mentor and then, you know, becoming head chef of his restaurant? Um, I, I don't think the dynamic really changed. Like we were still, we still had that great relationship. He, he flew over to the UK when I was over there. So we still had a really close bond. I mean, if anything, our, our relationship probably grew stronger because I was, I had more knowledge and, you know, I wasn't doing the stupid things that I was doing when I was 21 or 20 years of, of age, you know, I wasn't making those dumb mistakes. So he there was there was a bit of respect and i think i had more respect for him because he entrusted me in with his family business you've become a real feature of the dining landscape that's been evolving amazingly over the last sort of 5 to 10 years but, um what's what's been sort of your real key sort of moments in the in sort of your time since clarks that have um sort of shaped you as a chef um I've just I've just finished up three and a half years working at the Royal Hotel and and Fleur, so that was that was quite a big big step for me. Um, obviously, during that point we had COVID, so there was you know that whole situation for everyone. But we we opened the restaurant I think two months before COVID hit and WA went into like a into a full lockdown, so. That was definitely a scary point for me because no one really knew what was happening. And when you've spent 15, 14 years doing a, some, like one thing, you, you don't know what's going to happen afterwards. Has that sort of experience of, you know, you, you open literally just before COVID and then going through that, has it changed your perspective on and your approach to your craft? Yeah, I think. You, it, it definitely made you realize or made me realize that you have to adapt to to the situation, especially with with that un, like unfortunate situation that every, every single 
person in the world went through, it it makes it, it does make it harder for people to want to be able to go out. You know, it does make it harder for people to be able to have that extra bit of money to spend because, you know, I'm not sure for every, I can't speak for everyone, but, you know, for three months I was, I was out of work. Has the dining landscape changed and the expectation of diners changed during this time um, now that everything's back open over in Perth? Um, I think it's, it's definitely, it's starting to go back to normality now. But it has taken a while for that normality to 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 become something of a like to become normal again, really. You know, there's office workers that, you know, get told they can't go to restaurants, you get people that, that just want to eat at home, people will only go out once once a week, once a fortnight now, where you would have the regulars that would be there every week and slowly we're starting to see the world go back to, to, to normal. So that's, that's really positive for like for hospitality. One of the exciting things that is going on over there is the amount of sort of new restaurant and the energy of, of the culinary landscape and different offerings. Tell, tell us a little bit about what you love about what's happening in Perth at the moment. I think Perth is, is going really strongly. Um, they're opening a lot of different restaurants that are, that all have their own different speciality and their own little uniqueness. So, you know, there's not really one or two places that are exactly the same. So you can be able to experience that, you know, it is kind of, whereas Melbourne and Sydney, there's so many different vast restaurants that that cater for so many different things and Perth's coming back to doing that again, which is really great. Fleur at the Royal, which you mentioned, you were there for three and a half years. Tell us a little bit about your role there and, and your food, um, is there a dish or two that sort of exemplifies um, what you were doing? Yeah, so when when we opened, my my best mate was the like group exec chef. So he he asked me to come over, and I, I jumped on that offer. Um, so we opened up. We were doing like inspiration and like homage to Japanese flavors and techniques when we first opened. So that was a big learning curve for me because I didn't, I didn't realize how many different types of soy sauces there were and all of that kind of stuff, you know, and then we got our, our sous chef Rowan who, who'd worked a lot with indigenous ingredients. So he started to implement that into the menu and into the recipes. So I got to learn and understand and respect those ingredients for what they were and, and, you know, respect what Australia has to offer. Then we kind of changed again after COVID. Um, and then we went into a tasting menu and then we kind of dulged down French food. And, and then by the time I left, we were going into the bistro realm of, of, of style of cooking. So it was all like, we were constantly evolving and constantly learning and adapting to what, what we wanted to offer as well. So that was really, really cool. You've had an amazing connection with local uh, farmers and your new role will really sort of dive into that as well. Tell us a little bit about some of the connections you've made with WA producers. Yeah, so we we would we would use uh, quite a lot of West Australian produce and, you know, at Flow we would use wage and game. So they had some beautiful ducks there that we would have with our dry-aged duck, bre- uh, dry, dry duck crowns. So we would dry-age those for minimum of seven days, maximum of 14 days. And that would that was pretty much like a signature dish there for a good while while that was on the menu. So that was, you know, something great, which is, you know, 200 kilometers out, out of Perth. Um, we'd get Marin when Marin was in season. So obviously Marin is a beautiful produce product from down in Margaret River area and the same as the truffles. So we had a great relationship with, you know, those suppliers that would that would supply us. As you mentioned at the top of the show, um, your new role as head chef at Six Head, which will open in, in Perth a bit later in the year. The the restaurant in Sydney is a beast of a restaurant. It's a stunning fit out and incredible menu. Um, how, how are you feeling about the role? Are you, are you nervous about sort of what's ahead? Oh, I think you know. If I definitely, I'm definitely nervous. Um, I think nervous is being is is good because this is a new a new step for me and. And it's it's definitely a new challenge, and it's something that I'm I'm extremely excited to take on board. I think I'm going to learn a lot there, and I'll be able to give back what I've 
with what I've learned in my career to to all the junior staff and hopefully be able to create something beautiful. I know you're only a week in, but you've got sort of the next couple of months to plan and help create this restaurant. What are you sort of looking forward to over the next couple of months? Um, I think looking forward to, you know, meeting everyone within the company and definitely getting over to Sydney and seeing how their their operation works. And then when we come back here, going and meeting the suppliers, meeting the farmers and and building those relationships with with new with new people that we that I haven't that I haven't been able to work with before. And um, yeah, just getting on with that, I think. Tell us a little bit about the scope of the role, you know, with um, Fleur at the Royal, you really got to have to shine and put your voice on the plate with Six Head sort of already a Sydney restaurant. Um, How much of your identity sort of will be going into the new menu? Uh, well, we will be celebrating West Australian produce, and you know, I'm I'm from WA, so I hopefully I'll be able to to be able to to show that and make that shine because I, I I know WA produce, so that that's something that myself and Sean will be working really closely with. He'll be guiding me with what's going on, and you know, that's that's what we'll be going with that. Well, it's an exciting project that you're part of and you've already made such an influence over there in Perth and no doubt you will later this year when Six Head opens. Um, what, what do you love about what you do? I think my biggest satisfaction is, you know, seeing the smiles on people's face, you know, being able to work the, not only just with customers but with the staff as well, you know, being able to show and, and work together and and take something from a raw product and, and create something that is eaten in seconds, but hopefully it's like remembered for, for a long time. Well, Shane, um, it's amazing to catch up with you and look forward to seeing what you do over there with Six Head a bit later in the year. Um, please keep in touch and we'll catch up again soon. Definitely. Thank you very much for having me on the show. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.